for those curious to know what life was like in a maximum security prison. They need only visit West Virginia's now closed Moundsville Penitentiary. If you've ever wondered what death was like in a maximum security prison, then come at night. No, I'm not one of those guys that gets frightened easily. And I don't even believe in ghosts. Or I didn't until I went to Moundsville. My wife's into this paranormal stuff and she dragged me to one of those guided tours at the Moundsville Penitentiary. This was our maximum security. This guy was leading the tour. Led us down to this area in the prison. He was talking about all the prisoners who had committed suicide and, and committed other acts of murder within the prison. For the crimes they committed behind these walls, they beat, stabbed, and murdered behind these walls. In addition to all the violence that occurred here, many of these men got severely depressed and they committed suicide by hanging themselves in their cells. <laughs> I was just joking around with my wife. And then all of a sudden, I felt this scratching on my face. Like, like something was tearing into my skin. I reached my hand up and I brought it down. There was blood. It's one thing to be a skeptic when someone else is telling you what's going on. It's a whole nother thing when you have to experience it firsthand. Gordon Jones learned what it means to scoff at the idea that ghosts inhabit Moundsville. Moundsville Penitentiary in West Virginia was one of the most violent prisons in United States history. Murder, suicide, other violent crime, that was daily fear at Moundsville. Small wonder, then, that this is considered to be one of the most haunted facilities in all of North America. Here, behind the walls of West Virginia's Moundsville Prison, were housed some of the most brutal individuals imaginable. People for whom murder, rape, and assault were a way of life. But even for these human predators, life behind these walls could be maddening, and some would choose the shortest route out of this penitentiary. I worked a total of 18 years in this institution, 16 years of it, which was in healthcare, two years in administration as a deputy warden. Uh, my third day on the job in this institution, I was ordered to North Hall, just as I entered work, to cut a man down who had hung himself that morning. And they've always had a statement here at the prison that the, if you died in here, your soul stayed here. So I think that has a lot to do with a lot of our paranormal activity that we have inside the institution. Tom Moore and his group of researchers from Mid-Ohio Valley Ghost Hunters have been to Moundsville before. Today, they will focus on areas with a known history of violence, beginning with the Alamo, where the most dangerous criminals were confined. The Alamo is uh, basically uh, the part where uh, if you, you came to this prison, you pretty much never got out. Uh, uh, murderers, uh, severe criminals lived in this area. I'm currently using my night shot camcorder, seeing if I can capture any phenomena on film. This prison, of course, has a lot of different types of hauntings and spirits and ghosts has a lot of imprint hauntings. That's another real feature where you hear sounds, doors opening and closing. And then as you also have uh, other types of uh, non-human types of spirits, which is rather interesting. 
as well as earthbound spirits, uh, unhappy spirits that uh, really have no way of, of knowing how to move on. Our group was walking down the Alamo where some of the more disturbed um, and dangerous inmates were. And as we passed one of the cells, I sensed something, so I went back. And the cell I sensed something in, I felt and I saw this ectoplasm. So I went and I took a picture. And as I lowered my camera to see what I'd taken a picture of, I felt this horrible stabbing pain in my back and it doubled me over and I screamed and one of the girls came over to see if I was okay and I was fine and we walked away. But later I found out from one of the um, former guards who is now a tour guide here at the prison that one of the inmates was actually stabbed in his lower back almost at that precise place outside of his cell. It was one of the most disturbing experiences I've ever had. There's the legend of one ghost inmate, known as Boss Ghost. In real life, his name was Ren Schneider. When Schneider was apprehended in the basement of his home, he was cleaning up after what was to be his most notorious crime. A day earlier, Red Schneider had butchered his father, his mother, and even their dog. Their bodies were chopped up and neatly packed into a set of suitcases. Red Snyder was an inmate that uh, the entire time I was here for 18 years, he remained locked up in what we call the North Hall or the Alamo. Uh, I think I only saw him unlocked one time. Uh, his behavior was such that from the administrative standpoint, it wasn't safe for him to be in population. Uh, while he was in here, he killed twice. Ah! Uh, he had the notorious name and somebody wanted to take that name with him. And so right before the closure of our prison, uh, two boys uh, got up one morning to go to recreation. He was supposed to go with them. Um, and both of those boys stabbed him to death, stabbed him 38 times. So the Red Snyder aura stays with us to, to this day because his soul was inside this prison. The paranormal researchers begin their work in the cell of notorious murderer, Red Snyder. There's nothing in here now. It's a current 64, 65 degrees in here. It's a consistent. Oh. Okay. Uh-oh. All right. Uh-oh. There they go. He's back. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Well, earlier in the evening, we were in this particular section, and Red was being discussed. Um, he sort of visited a, us for a while. Well, he's not totally understanding what's going on, and it pulls him back here you know, for you to even mention his name or talk about him. Um, with any kind of a spirit, the more you talk about them, the more you focus on them, the more, the stronger they get, you know? And uh, same is true with him, but he's fading in and out, which is interesting why he's doing that. Right now, what I'm feeling is I feel that my throat, there's someone has my voice box and is actually pressing on my voice box right now. Uh, that's not unusual in places like this. And uh, probably, after I go home, home after a while, I'll be okay. But right now, there's a lot of pressure right on my voice box as I'm talking about this. We were walking down the Alamo once again. I was walking with one of the tour guides who was formerly a prison guard, and we saw the shadow man. And he's this shadowy, dark figure. And we saw him at the exact same time, and as we tried to approach him, he kept stepping back. Every couple steps we tried to take forward, he'd recede back. And the thing about the shadow man is that his face is dark, you can't see it, it's a shadow. And it's one of the most common sightings here. A lot of people have seen the shadow man. We find it throughout the prison. Uh, the most famous one now is the shadow man. I've actually seen him in two different photographs by two different people that have photographed him inside the institution. Can't explain who he is or where he came from, but uh, it's certainly a, a 
a shadow of a man inside this institution. Well, we're about to do an investigation of the hole, which is sometimes referred to the solitary confinement. In this location, there was an inmate who was cut to ribbons by a, a group of inmates who thought he was a snitch for the warden. People say he's still here. He still works here. He's still down here in the dark. This is part of the maintenance area. They have the boiler rooms. So they ambushed him down here and cut him to ribbons before anyone found him. And this is where they found his body. The sightings of the sh the, him walking above this area were documented by the guards while the prison was still open. They would call from one guard tower to the next to see if one of the inmates was out when he wasn't supposed to be, and that was after the murder. Well, as I walked in here, um, pretty much what I felt from the inmate that was, was actually murdered down here was he was first ambushed uh, he was stabbed in the kidneys. That's where the initial blows started as his back was turned. And that's pretty much, they were pretty strong stabs there in the kidneys. But I'm not, this is not the kind of spirit I really want to open myself up to, you know, and begin to communicate with. I don't want to, so I'm not. I just don't really want to, I don't really want to open up to him. The uh, Sugar Shack is a, a place located in our basement. Uh, it was named because it was an area where the inmates would go and play cards, recreation, and so forth. But it became a very violent place. There was a lot of strong arming that went on inside there. Strong arming is where a tougher inmate would take something from a weaker inmate. So when it came to the gambling issues, when it came to playing cards, when it came down to the exchange of money, that was very violent in that area. It's very hard to secure. It's very difficult for officers to, to do their job in that area. Uh, it only lasted about a year and a half, and then after that, we closed the sugar shack. We're getting ready to do an investigation on the sugar shack, which is the, one of the most active places in the prison. There were a lot of violence, a lot of rapes, shankings, a lot of horrible things have left their imprints on this area. And we're gonna investigate and see what's still down here. Electricity's off, so it can't be an external source. Okay, um, with the Gauss meter, it's picking up variations in electromagnetic field by just. See, we're getting some interference now. <laughs> They're happy to see us. But it just, it can signify something passing an area, a hot spot of paranormal activity. What you have down here is you have a lot of negativity in human acts. Uh, it attracts a lower type of entity um, that in past ages might be called demons. Uh, there's little creatures that kind of squirm around on the floor. Uh, they sort of remind me of uh, things in paintings by Bosch. Um, and it seems like what happened was uh, some of the prisoners that were here in, in an effort to intimidate some of, you know, stronger prisoners, uh, be, we'd say that they were devil worshipers or uh, join, join the Church of Satan or something like that. But um, the last ghost hunt we did in Moundsville, uh, one of these little entities followed me home. And for about a month, we had the sound of like a baby crying. But as you listen closer to this baby crying, you could tell that the voice, the sound, was not exactly human. Anybody that I would consider extra sensitive, impressionable in any way should not come to Moundsville Penitentiary because uh, it can actually affect your health and affect your mood. We've investigated three major parts of the prison, three very active parts. We've gotten a lot of readings with our meters. We've gotten a lot of interesting photos. We're going to check for EVPs. We've gotten a lot of activity. 
very successful hunt. This is a very haunted, haunted location. Are there really ghosts at Moundsville? Did Lisa Cox come into contact with one? And what about Gordon Jones? Can they all be mistaken? And if there are ghosts at Moundsville, who are they? Who is Boss Ghost? Who is Shadow Man? Is Boss Ghost the spirit of Red Snyder? Whatever is haunting the cells and corridors of Moundsville Prison is malevolent and does not want to be disturbed. Visitors are not welcome and may be harmed if they stay. The Ottawa County Jail was built in 1862 to house criminals in the Ottawa district. Anybody could be prison here. There was women, there was children, families, hardened criminals, people who owed money. There was public hangings, torture cells. There was a lot of death, a lot of disease. Lots of different things that are even unthinkable today. Guards can actually torture or hurt prisoners should they want to. The inhumane living conditions solitary confinement cells. This wasn't a prison that anybody would want to stay in. This was more like hell on earth. Uh, Carleton County Jail is haunted. It's probably one of the most haunted buildings in Canada. This jail is littered with spirits. People have numerous experiences that are staying in this jail today that's now a youth hostel. Housed in this prison were many different types of prisoners. You had murderers alongside petty thieves. Even children were housed here. Children were placed in jail as a result of theft, and often when families didn't pay their debts, the whole family was incarcerated in the jail. I mean, there's a lot of stories about um, people hearing children crying, people hearing children speaking, um, maybe songs, stories, things like that. The need to have a women's prison solely in this prison was needed, so they converted the ninth floor, which was once for a couple of years the hospital, into a women's prison. The majority of the women staying there were prostitutes being taken off the streets and put into this prison. Some people believe that the legacy of all this human suffering still remains within the prison today. Some people even believe that it may be haunted as a result of all the different things that happened here. This place actually had a number of different things happening in the, in the prison all the time. Even public hangings happened here. Canadians have always been fascinated with crime. And at one time, thousands would participate by attending public hangings in this country. One of the most famous people who were hanged at the jail was Patrick Whalen. And Patrick Whalen was accused of murdering Thomas Darcy McGee, one of the fathers of Confederation. And Patrick Whalen, when he was hanged on February the 11th, on the 11th hour of 1869, 5,000 people watched Patrick Whalen swing. So, believe it or not, Patrick Whalen believes he was innocent. And that's why he stays there. Okay, this is death row. And this cell just here is a cell where Mr. Patrick James Whalen spent 10 months awaiting his execution along with his own personal guard, Mr. John Lyle. On the day of his execution, he would be taken out of here and accompanied with his guard and the prison warden and a clergyman all the way down to the gallows, taking what we call the walk of death. Uh, when you get down to the gallows, you'll stand in front of the trap door and this priest will read you your last rites. On the words, may God have mercy on your soul, you'll step back onto the trap door and hang to your death. Mr. Whalen did not actually hang on these words. He hung on his own personal speech, which, uh, which goes something along the lines of, uh, I forgive all those who have wronged me, I forgive all those I have wronged. God save Ireland and God save my soul. And on those words, he stepped back and hung to his death. but we also have a number of sightings of Mr. Patrick James Whalen. People staying in here say they either had someone walk straight through the bars or open the door and come and, uh, come and talk to them. Uh, the description we take always matches that of Mr. Patrick James Whalen. Uh, the reason that Mr. Patrick James Whalen uh, haunts the place, they say, is that uh, firstly, the date he was hung. He was hung at 11 o'clock on the 11th of February, 1869. Superstition dictates that you are to be hung at the 13th hour of the 13th day of the month. Therefore, Whalen was two hours and two days too early. Such was uh, their haste to get over and done with. Secondly, he was buried with his noose around his neck, uh, something that, again, superstition dictates is not to happen as the noose is to be burnt. Thirdly, he is buried on, on uh, 
prison property, which is now hostel property. And keep in mind, those that were hanged, they were not allowed to be buried in a holy cemetery. There has been stories that people say they see a figure in the cells. Some people say that they think it's another hostel or somebody staying here until he walks through the bars. And then they go, oh, what was that? If I said to you, uh, I, I saw a man, he had a big plumed hat on, big feathers sticking out the end, and he had a sword at his side, and he had, he had funny little shoes, and you say, gosh, Christopher Columbus haunts this place. You've described Prince, Prince Christopher Columbus. People would say, yeah, big hat with a... I don't know what Christopher Columbus looked like. But, but all you need to do is mention a few things that would suit a, a, a person that you're looking for and it will match. So uh, what is the match for a prisoner who's hung there? What do you say? He's short? He's tall? Uh, he's got a mustache? You know, out of 10 or 12 things you say, maybe only two or three of them match, but they'd match a whole bunch of people. But it's very easy for people to say, oh, this is a direct hit. Yeah, I find when I walk on death row, you know that feeling you get with the piglies on the back of your neck? I always get that. People report having felt cold spots here. They say the cells are colder, some areas are colder. I find this whole floor to be a lot colder. The prison gets quite warm, but for some reason, death row is always much colder than the rest of the place. In 1862, I'm sure you can imagine that the medical field wasn't nearly as advanced and disease inside of the prison was rampant. Epidemics flew through here like never before. Downstairs in the basement was the quarantine area. Funny enough, it's actually right next to the prison kitchen. It was in this area that uh, anybody suffering from a disease that could be contagious was sent down. They were usually sent there to live out their final days before dying of whatever disease they had. When they built the bridge next door uh, to the hostel, they actually found mass burial sites. Hundreds of people thrown into a pit. It was believed, or it was said, people from the prison, anybody who died here, they might be just wrapped in a blanket and thrown into this pit. One of the reasons that they think the hauntings occur here is actually because of these mass burial sites in the back courtyard. The injustice of it all to so many people. Next door to the hostel, there's a courthouse. And it was in that courthouse that prisoners would have been sentenced to whatever they were sentenced to. They'd be brought underground and up by the solitary confinement cells. This was done on purpose. The prison was designed so that anybody entering the prison would have to see the kind of torture that other prisoners endured. It was a warning sign. You misbehave, you'll end up in the solitary confinement cells. They have an area in the jail they call the hole. And this is where prisoners would be taken for six months at a time. And even when you tour the hole to this day, you can see little etchings on the floor where they had grabbed something in order to make a mark on the floor of the prisoners. And many of them died in the hole. And uh, to go into the hole yourself today is quite an eerie experience. Downstairs in the solitary confinement cell, I know that I almost always feel that there's somebody always behind me. And I, I do quick looks behind me to see who's there, and there's never anybody there. Other people say that they've seen people, that they've heard footsteps. That whole area downstairs, people have said they hear screams, that they hear crying, anything like that, doors being slammed. All sorts of crazy things happen down there. I don't think a particular age group such as older teenagers would be any more susceptible than adults. Of course, younger teenagers and children are much more susceptible to their imaginations and to suggestibility. But if you, if you take the group that's going through the Ottawa Youth Hostel, they're probably, most of them, they're late teens. Now, they, they may be more susceptible not because of their age, but because of, of their outlook on the world. Many people who stay in youth hostels are are trying to seek adventure and, and opening all kinds of doors to different belief systems. And that may make them more susceptible. They may be more rejecting of sort of the, the conservative approach to the world that everything can be explained normally and they're interested in finding all kinds of new levels of meaning. So that may make them more, more prone to, to experience ghosts by misinterpretation of normal things around them. Well, there's a back stairway in the jail that's connected to the governor's house. But back in the 1970s, when they were restoring the jail, they found an inscription on the wall going down the stairs. And the inscription read that I am a vampire and I will feast on your body. If you want to find the way of the path, you need to climb 94 or 95 stairs and you will find a book at the top of the bookshelf. There is a story about the side staircase, which is known as the secret staircase. And there was an inscription on the wall. And it 
inscription about um, vampire ghosts. Now, the story goes is that one of the children, one of the, the warden's children, was on his way out to school, and it was a van vampire ghost. I mean, we're not talking blood-sucking ghosts. We're, these types of ghosts are ghosts that prey on the weak, the young, the sick, the old. Anyways, and that this child was out to school one day, and that this ghost actually possessed the child. This child being young, this child being ill. And he got sicker and sicker. And uh, they were able to tell from little things that he did that this was not normal. This child never really, I mean, he was an active, loving, happy child until one day things switched and that this little poem was written in the side staircase. So there are rumors that there is a vampire haunting this jail. They don't know who did it. They don't know how it got there. It was just there. For anyone wishing to have an experience seeing a spirit, the Ottawa Carlton Jail is a place to stay. You're guaranteed that you'll see something, feel something, or hear something there. The Old Cornwall Jail, now a museum, is one of Ontario's oldest public buildings, and one of its creepiest. Built in 1892, it housed not just felons, but the orphaned and mentally insane. In the 1960s, the bodies of seven murderers were uncovered in forgotten graves in the courtyard. These are just some of the many souls who lived, suffered, and died within its walls. And it seems their spirits linger on today. We went there on a visitation. We were getting a tour of the jail. And it was really actually kind of funny because we were joking about what the cells were like and what it would be like inside the cells. She actually locked me in one of the cells, which I didn't think was very funny. This isn't funny, Carrie. Carrie, that's not funny. Carrie, come on, where are you? Carrie? Carrie? Carrie, where are you? I ended up getting separated from my friend, and I ended up in this visiting area. I, I don't know, it was, it was a really weird room. It was kind of creepy. I wanted to get the feeling of what the inmates felt to see their family on the other side. The phone rings and I answered it, but there was a dead silence on the phone. And I heard my name called, so I turned and looked. There wasn't anybody there either. And then I heard my name again, but louder and more, more urgent. So I turned and looked, and again, nobody there. Then I felt a really, really cold hand just swipe across the back of my neck. It creeped me out so bad, I took off running. I was so freaked out. Then I stopped, and I turned around, and there was this man. There was this man sitting on the stool. He had dark hair and his eyes were very beady and he was staring at me. He's staring at me as if he really knew me. There are three phones in the guard's office. One leads to the police station, one to the fire station, and one directly out to the exercise yard. They've all been disconnected. I personally have been out in the exercise yard on two occasions with groups of people and the phone has rang more than once. So, Curious, I walked over to pick it up and there was a buzzing sound in it. Hung it up, picked it up again, and it was dead. Nearly everyone who visits Cornwall Jail reports the feeling of strange presences lurking in the maze of corridors, cramped cells, and common living areas. Others have actually seen apparitions from the jail's brutal past. Spirits who seem to be trapped in this place by their evil deeds. In the 1950s, a horrible crime dominated the headlines for almost a year. Peter Balcombe, an army sergeant from London, Ontario, brutally murdered his girlfriend. They had met through the army in Quebec City and were returning through Dundas County, where a fatal turn of events began to unfold. Marie Anne Carrier was a former girlfriend. The two had just recently started dating again. But evidently, on this date, something went horribly wrong. The couple argued, 
and Marianne left the car and started walking to the nearest town. Balcombe followed her and beat her to within an inch of her life, then pulled out a knife and finished her off, leaving her body to rot in a rural ditch. After a lengthy trial, Peter Balcombe was sentenced to hang for his despicable crime. He was the last person to take the somber path to death at Cornwall Jail. His spirit joined the many others whose bodies dropped lifeless from the gallows and were buried in the courtyard. Tonight, we're located at the Cornwall Jail. We're down in the basement. Now, I would like to ask permission, whoever is with us tonight, to take videos and audios. We don't mean no disrespect. We don't mean no harm. Can you give us any sign at all? Any sign that you're present with us? If, you just had a norm? Yeah. Uh, just, uh, just right now at uh, 210. I had an orb fly across uh, the screen, the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. It was a fairly bright orb. And what direction did it go? It was from moving from top to bottom, so sort of on a diagonal. Whoever is with us right now, please show us that you're here. Can you touch anyone in this room right now? Can you give us any sign, any physical sign? that there's someone in this room. Who do we have? Please speak up. Who are you? Pain was like something was like hitting me in the back of the head and I felt like my arm was numb like I didn't feel like it was cut off or something like it was just painful like ripped out we got a reading around her EMF shows approximately 3.5 do you know who it is Donna? with the white light, protect us with the white light, surround us with the white light, protect us with the white light, surround us with the white light, protect us with the white light. Just talk to them, Donna, okay? You're the one that's in control. They don't need no harm. This is just a way to communicate with you, okay? You just have to talk to them. Tell them there's no pain, you don't want no pain. They don't mean to hurt you. It's just a way to communicate with you. You just have to ask who it is and why they're doing this to you. Okay? I want to know why you guys are doing this to me. And was this the type of pain that you guys went through? What I think that happened with her is during my, during the two weeks ago we did an investigation here, I had an impression of a of a, a guard that actually was in charge of this kitchen and he was probably the one causing physical harm, which is never happens but she was actually feeling how the inmates were actually treated here in the kitchen the kitchen area is uh, quite an interesting area because during the renovations to build that region 
the uh, excavators found two underground dungeons, if you wish to call them that. They were certainly very small square rooms, no windows, no way to get into them other than to drop someone from above, sort of dropping them into a hole in the ground. There was no record of them ever existing in the jail, and we could find no one who knew of them or had any knowledge of them. But yet there they were, they existed, and just by their sheer existence, we could tell that they must have been used in the earlier days as some sort of a solitary confinement or a major punishment for any of the uh, inmates. The Cornwall Jail was actually built in 1833-1834, was opened in 1834. In the early days, it served as um, an insane asylum to a point because there were many people who would bring children that they could no longer take care of who were mentally ill and leave them with the jail keeper to spend the rest of their days here. When the paranormal group were here investigating, they did hear children's voices up in the courtroom. Hi, when we're in the courtroom, there was uh, a lot of activity that we were getting in uh, it was like around 12 o'clock or uh, around 1.30. We start hearing children playing around. And I asked my partner that's in my group, did you hear anything? And so I just wanted to make sure she heard the same thing as me. And I'm like, she's like, I heard children playing around, like laughing. And there was a few children. So when the lady, Candy, that works here, said that she heard the same thing. So um, I start getting a cold feeling and I was freezing. And that's when I knew that there was something there. At the same time, they felt that they had light footprints showing on the stairwell coming up to the courtroom from the jail itself. In one of their videotapes, they have a small apparition that very much looks like a young child. I think a boy, in fact. So it's not out of the possibility that there is a spirit of a young child here. Our first investigation, I was sitting in cell block three and we had a camera positioned in the back of me and I was sitting in a picnic table and I was asking questions and one of the questions that I ask is, do we have any children here? As I'm asking the questions, uh, we work on infrared so we don't use any kind of, of lights and my light on my camcorder went on and off. So we thought people was playing a prank so I asked the members, who's playing with the light? It says, no one. And um, at the end of the evening, the following day, we went home and we actually seen on one of our uh, cameras that in cell block three, as I was asking the question, um, do we have any children here? We actually seen an apparition of a little boy coming out from a cell block, coming towards the camera, matter of a, of a second and going back into his place. So we think that the little boy was the one that actually flickered the light on and off. If you compare different prison in Ontario, um, this prison, what happened, which is very unusual, is they have a mixture of inmates, and especially people that were actually uh, diagnosed mentally unstable. They will actually put someone who's mentally unstable with someone that was a petty thief. And I believe myself that there is there's actually um, undisclosed information the amount of people that were actually brutally, brutally or physically hurt in the prison here. During the late 1870s, a man by the name of Jim Sutherland was convicted of petty larceny and sent to Cornwall Jail. What he stole was never recorded, but his punishment was clearly documented. He was to endure a severe whipping for a period of an hour with the use of fine cord until his body be bloody. The hapless Jim Sutherland suffered further punishment at the hands of a cruel prison guard named Barn, who taunted and beat him mercilessly. Sutherland would go missing for days to show up more bruised and beaten and even more withdrawn. Jim Sutherland never made it out of Cornwall Jail. He died alone in solitary 
confinement. Another area of the jail that has had a fair bit of paranormal activity is the women's cell. It was built in the 60s, and I know that the paranormal group has on tape what appears to be a woman's voice whispering, lock it. Another area that has seen a fair bit of activity is the general population area. There was um, cells for 10 people up there, but in the n last number of years, there were oftentimes double that number of prisoners up there, so it was very crowded. And reports are that there was a fair bit of violence up there. Um, so there seems to be a lot of paranormal activity up there. We've had doors opening and closing, and that's where oftentimes the lights are on when we've turned them off. We're going up to the courtroom to do an investigation into the paranormal activities that have been recorded in the jail. This is probably the, uh, one of the most active places in the whole jail. Um, there's been uh, sounds of chairs being dragged across the floor when no one was there to make the sounds. There's a original prisoner's uh, box that has been, we've heard, opening and closing. So there's been a fair bit of activity up here. Why do you remain in the jail? Why are you still here? Someone, uh, did you hear that thump? Did someone just make a thumping noise? They come from the far, the other side of the room there. One thump. Just right in this area, I felt like a, like a but right now actually I'm feeling it right now. Like there's like a, there's, it's really drafty in here, like more than usual. I didn't get nothing on my camera, but I just, I feel the energy, like there's something present here. Right here, I do definitely feel uh, a cold spot. And as I walked to uh, the other side of the room, it got, got warmer. Now, I don't know if it's a power of suggestion, but I'm feeling what Maria says she feels. Another area of significant activity is the courtroom, a place where an individual's fate was decided. It was here in the 1950s that Henry Sagan's fate was sealed. Henry Sagan had a long list of previous convictions, but in 1954, his life of crime came to an end. He pulled into Leonard Hurd's garage, demanding the day's take. He riddled the owner with a spray of bullets before fleeing the scene. On the day of his execution, Henry Sagan sought the consolation of Father Rudolf Villeneuve. But with only an hour before his execution, the murderer collapsed at Father Villeneuve's feet, dead from a self-administered dose of poison. Of all my experience, I've been in the paranormal field for 12 years. If I can tell you if there's uh, paranormal activities, this is the place where it is. Um, it's, it's very active where we can't even keep up uh, the amount of sound and video that there is. There's solitary confinement, cell block three, journal population. Um, I mean, there's no place where it's not active. And yes, this place is definitely haunted. With a long history of enforced confinement, the Cornwall Jail is a breeding ground for paranormal activity. Visitors should listen for the sound of whispers and footsteps. If they're quick, they may even catch a glimpse of the ghosts who lurk in the shadows there. On the island of Carpoon in Newfoundland, a local resident was on her way to visit a friend. As she walked along the path by the shore, she felt a strange presence. 
as if someone was watching her. Then, from the corner of her eye, the woman saw something on a nearby hill. A man was standing there, watching her. He looked to be in his mid-twenties and was wearing an old-fashioned sailor suit. He just stood there and watched her, but then he disappeared. He looked so lonely, the woman thought he might jump. But he walked away and disappeared into thin air. The woman was so shaken, she turned back home. The island of Carpoon at the very northern tip of Newfoundland is one of the most remote locations Creepy has ever visited. It's a place where people from around the world come to escape the hustle and bustle of their crowded cities and their hectic lifestyles. For many, the isolation and solitude is blissful. But the history of this beautiful place tells another tale. One filled with stories of lost souls and loneliness. The most popular and the most forlorn of all is the legend of Marguerite de Roberval and the Isle of Demons. Watch this. In the spring of 1542, under the direction of the King of France, a wealthy captain, Jean-Francois de la Roque de Roberval, set sail to colonize and spread the word of Christianity in North America. A man of stern and relentless disposition, he came to the new land to stake his claim and spread the word of God. His niece, Marguerite, was a courageous and strong woman, looking for a change from the luxury of the French courts. She pleaded with her uncle to be allowed to join them. He agreed to take her along. Marguerite and her servant nurse joined her uncle and his crew. On the long journey over the Atlantic Ocean, the adventurous Marguerite fell in love with one of the rogue sailors. Marguerite knew her uncle would be angry. She had fallen for a man of poor breeding, and the young lovers attempted to keep their affair hidden, but they were discovered. Marguerite's uncle was furious. Marguerite had disgraced the family name and made a fool of him by carrying on the affair under his watch. When the captain ordered the sailor to be executed by hanging, the cavalier pledged his eternal love for Marguerite by giving her his sole earthly possession, a beautiful ring. To make matters worse, Marguerite was pregnant. The uncle was further incensed when his niece pleaded for the man's life, declaring her love for the sailor over her family. So he decided to spare the lover his life and instead banished both the lover and Marguerite to a desolate island. It was a remote place where many were left to die among the hideous creatures that were believed to inhabit the island. It was a place known as the Island of Demons. Today the island is known as Carpoon, but sailors referred to her as the Isle of Demons. Sailors believed that souls unworthy of entering heaven were doomed to wander this spot halfway between heaven and hell. As the small boat approached the desolate looking island, there was no sign of human life. But there were mysterious shapes moving about in the shadows near the shore, believed to be the fiendish imps and angry spirits. The banished trio was given some supplies, a gun and ammunition, and left behind to fend for themselves. While they watched from shore, the ship sailed away. It was the last sign of civilization in their lives. They built a shelter and survived off the land. Each day they looked to the sea and waited for a ship, a ship which never came. But they persisted and Marguerite had her child. Strong winds would batter their hut the nights were long, cold, and terrifying. Strange-sounding gales were relentless, like spirit voices calling. These were not the noises of humans or even wild animals. The sounds were of another world, night after night, threatening Marguerite and her family. One night, the lover, unable to withstand the tormenting calls from the spirits, tried to protect his wife and child. He ran.
ran from their hut, but couldn't see what made the sounds. Suddenly, he was attacked by an invisible force, which bit at his skin and raged at his soul. The lover returned, beaten and bruised. It was the last time any of them ventured out of the hut after dark. Together, the lonely souls fought for their sanity and survival. But eventually, the hardships of the North Atlantic terrain were too much for them. Marguerite buried each one in succession. The lover was the first to die. Shortly after, the nurse perished. Nearly insane from anger and loneliness, Marguerite confronted her demons. She needed to find her freedom. She needed to find a way off the island. Marguerite lit fires, but that only terrified passing sailors more. For seeing the smoke rising from the shore, they thought that it was the smoke rising from the Isle of Demons, the smoke rising from the flames of an eternal hell. Eventually, word of Marguerite's predicament reached France, and a ship was sent to retrieve her. Marguerite was saved. Her uncle, however, suffered a very different fate. He was a hard master, and eventually his own ship's mates mutinied and rebelled against his rule. He found himself marooned, stranded on the Isle of Demons, the same island that had been home to Marguerite. In the mid-1800s, some young children were playing on the beach when one of them found a mysterious object. A ring. As she called over to her playmates to examine the find, an old woman named Emmeline, who lived nearby, approached the children. She asked the children what they were looking at. As soon as they showed her the ring, she felt strangely drawn to it, needing to possess it. She offered the children some sweet biscuits in exchange for the ring. The ring became her most prized possession. That night, the woman had a dream. At least she thought it was a dream. Marguerite came to her and said that the ring had belonged to her. In her haste to get off the island when she was rescued, it had fallen from her finger and was left behind. She also said that the woman must always wear it. As long as she does, she will go to heaven. Word spread about the ring and eventually, a rich man from town heard the story, and he offered Emmeline a vast sum of money, more money than she had ever dreamed of, but still she refused. Denied, the man became angry, and he left in a rage. Apparently, the rich man must have felt some remorse after having left in such a rage, and he sent Emmeline a peace offering, a bottle of rum. A few days later, Emmeline died mysteriously and suddenly in her sleep. Was she poisoned? No one knows, but she was laid to rest in her grave with the ring on her finger. Two days later, in the dead of the night, the entire town was awoken by a strange screaming, many people claiming that it was the sound of Emmeline herself. They rushed to the site of her burial and found the grave open. The coffin was there, the body was there, but the ring was gone. I wanted to literally escape. I just wanted to find a nice place to find some peace and quiet, do a little writing, re-energize. And just as I was sitting there enjoying this beautiful view, I heard something. So I wasn't quite sure. But then I heard it again. So I decided to go have a look. So I looked around to see if I could find anything. And I didn't really see him at first. But then there he was. And he was kind of there, but he wasn't quite there. You could see kind of right through him. I knew he had to be a ghost. He was calling out. Marguerite! He was actually calling out, and and uh, and you know he was he looked very agitated, like he was looking for someone. He couldn't find him, and uh, you know I, I I seen him, but I, I wasn't really scared or anything like that. I, I kind of felt sorry for him. And then I caught something else, and I looked over and I seen two of them, and there were two women, and they were looking for something, but I couldn't quite make out, and they were obviously very concerned about whatever they were searching, and they spotted me. 
but they didn't seem scared, or I didn't seem scared of them. But they seemed rather disappointed that whatever they were looking for, I wasn't it. And then they just disappeared. It was really weird. I mean, there must have been some kind of connection between the two of them. They were looking for, either, either the two women were looking for the guy or, or, or something. Did the tourist get an accidental glimpse into the spirit world? Is the spirit of Marguerite still looking for her missing ring? Are the lovers still trying to find each other? Are they tied to this island as part of a penance they must serve? Eternal captives on this Isle of Demons. In 1832, the British built Fort Henry, a defensive outpost situated on Lake Ontario in Kingston. The conditions were deplorable. Soldiers were often flogged and rationed, and for that reason, spirits linger to this day. Now, Fort Henry is also known as one of the most haunted buildings in Kingston. It has various inhabitants, spooks of all shapes and sizes, from poltergeists to revolutionaries who are trying to cause mischief up to this day. One spirit seems to dominate in death just as he did in life. Nils von Schultz was a European officer who made his services available in America. He was the leader of a rebellion in which American rebels invaded Canada. They were defeated at the Battle of the Windmill. Von Schultz was captured after the furious battle, brought to Fort Henry on charges of treason and imprisoned in the guards room. Von Schultz was respected by his captors, but it was impossible to ignore the gravity of his crimes. The British made an example of him in order to deter other rebellions. Von Schultz was hanged at Fort Henry. And he is definitely the best candidate that anyone has come across who is still haunting Fort Henry to this day. It may also have been Von Schultz that various individuals here at the fort have seen in one of the officers' guard rooms. There has been the figure of a man seated at a table and then again leaning in the window. And it very well may be that Von Schultz is still reminding people of his presence. The officers' quarters have been the scene of many strange events, possibly related to Von Schultz. A guard heard noises in the courtyard one night, so he followed the sounds to the officers' quarters. Upon entering, he was not greeted by an intruder, but rather a strange and unearthly blue light floating in the air, at one point almost taking on a human form. He was shocked and ran off to report this to his superiors. He was not the first person to report such an incident. Now up on the ramparts, some of the members of the guard here at Fort Henry have experienced a sighting. They have looked out over the wall and seen a structure standing on the hill. When they question anyone else about what this structure is, they are inevitably met with blank looks. And when they go to point out where the structure is over the wall, they find that it has vanished. Now little did they know that a structure identical to this stood just on the hill outside of Fort Henry in 1838. And it was the gallows used to hang Nils von Schultz. There was in fact a photograph that was taken of this shadowy figure in the window. It's very definitely the figure of a human being. And it could very well be Nils von Schultz. And men were punished when the fort was garrisoned. Punished by walking long hours under the hot sun in the parade square. They were forced to march as punishment for various offenses, especially for public drunkenness. Now it could very well be that this wandering ghost here at Fort Henry was one of those men who succumbed to the hot sun. And considering how dehydrated that these men would already be, it's not really all that surprising that they would faint or even drop dead. Another room here at Fort Henry that's generally believed to be haunted is the bakery. And it's haunted by not only an ordinary spirit, but by a poltergeist. 
Now, a poltergeist is a spirit that tends to be very cruel, but very playful at the same time, constantly moving things around and breaking things. Now, poltergeists are generally tied to the energies of a young girl. And this would make sense because the bakery is one of the very few rooms in Fort Henry where children would have been allowed. On one occasion, there was a baker who was making bread early in the morning. And she left the room for only a moment. When she heard a terrific crash come from inside, and she went running back in only to discover that the pants contained in one of the shelves on the wall were flung clear across the room and had crashed against the opposite wall and were now lying in a heap on the floor. And it's also been discovered that the poltergeist likes to play games with the doors. It will occasionally slam the doors and open them again when anyone is inside the bakery. And it will even hold the doors shut when anyone is trying to get in. There was a guard and he was trying to get into the bakery and he managed to open the door by only a couple of inches. When it stopped, as if it were caught on something, now he pushed with all of his might and he couldn't get the door open. He began throwing his whole weight against the door, trying to dislodge whatever was on the other side. And finally, in sheer frustration, he shouted, I gotta get in there. At which point, the door swung open on its own, and he was able to continue into the bakery. Now, this has happened on more than one occasion. Guides from the Haunted Walk have been known to have the door blocked. It's become something of a supernatural jest to say to the door, I have to get in there. At which point, the door always swings open on its own, allowing whoever is outside in. That could be embedded like a recording into the walls. So perhaps somebody who is psychic or intuitive or open or empathetic could come in and act as a receiver. Be that as it may, there's a lot of young teenagers who work there. And that's a great time to have scary stories. And I bet there are some older people that pass on these stories. So these are, you know, it's nice to be young and impressionable and you know, all these scary movies that are out for teenagers uh, embellish and exaggerate and add on to the stories that are there. But there may be an element of something there, of the paranormal. Fort Henry. It must have been a terrible place to serve. Even today, people hear noises and see things in the shadows. Unexplained events have occurred within the fort walls.